Okay, so I'm starting this a little bit differently today. There were three quotes that I found which I thought or could help us best describe some of the topics that we're actually going to be hitting on today. The first one, food is symbolic of love when words are inadequate. The second, cooking is like love. It should be entered into with abandon or not at all. And the third one, if you really want to make a friend, go to someone's house and eat with them. The people who give you their food give you their heart. Three quotes that I thought were quite fitting. So trying to figure out how to start this podcast was a bit of a challenge for me this week. We have award-winning chef, sommelier, philanthropist, and iconic restaurant owner, Stephen Becta here as my guest. His story, which starts from a broken home, busting dishes, like doing the dishes uh, all through high school at a variety of different restaurants. I find his story is really truly remarkable as to how he ended up as the man behind some of the country's most uh, top rated favorite restaurants in the country. So we'll start into episode 35 of Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, you can head to extensionmarketing.com. Steven. Great to have you here. Hey, thanks so much. I'm, I'm really excited for this one. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're going to hit on, on a variety of topics. You heard the three quotes. Did one of them yeah. kind of resonate with you? Was it something like well, that you all, can see? Well, all of them did. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, food is, is such an important part of our, our life. Uh, my, a quote that I love, my old boss, Danny Meyer, uh, talks about it, that, uh, you know, when we are born, we get uh, three things right away. We get um, uh, a hug. We get a smile and we get a good meal uh, right away. And we try to relive that moment throughout our lives. So we're looking for those three things, um, a hug, a smile, and a good meal. It's so true. And it, it, they're basic. Yeah. They're basic needs. And yet when they're fulfilled, we feel whole. That's it. It's so true. It, it really is. Okay. So with that being said also, um, there's an aspect of love and kind of having these relationships. You have Becta, a dining and wine. You have play and you have Gazellig. Yep. Is this like asking which one is your favorite child? Is there an aspect of, of, of that to these three? Absolutely. It's, you know, uh, they, they are all unique and there are no favorites. Um, you know, <laughs> on, on any given day as, you know, the, the plumbing might break at one, it may not be your favorite child that day, but, <laughs> but ultimately it needs your love just as much or more than the others. Do you find that there's different aspects of yourself that come through in each of these restaurants? They're, they're different. There's different expectations from the clients that are going or what they're anticipating for the meal or for the night uh, that you're able to cater to all three of those. Yeah, absolutely. And they're, and they're constantly in flux as well. Um, you know, Becta was originally created uh, as um, supposed to be a great neighborhood restaurant that people could go to all the time. But right out of the gate, we got a lot of accolades. And so people uh, equated that with fine dining. And then so our management team kept pushing the bar on bigger and better and more elaborate things like tasting menus and, and, you know, really special, unique ingredients. And so it became a special occasion restaurant where that was never what I intended. Yeah, it's funny because I, I, I never would have thought that. You, I thought back then it's like, okay, I have to have a purpose, a reason, a celebration to be able to to kind of go. There had to be a reason. It wasn't just that I was thinking, oh, I'm craving something tonight. Let's go to back then. That's it. And so, you know, as, as approachable and accessible as, as we hoped we were in terms of price, in terms of style, um, in terms of formality, we really... Uh, realize that people are using this for their fine dining special meal restaurants, you know, uh, closing a business deal, a special anniversary or birthday. Um, you know, so we said, okay, you know, after a few years, it was obvious that we wanted to do something else and we wanted to take it less seriously. So that's where we created play. Literally the, the name was about what our intentions were. We wanted to play with food and wine and not have it taken so seriously. Small plates, uh, very casual, just come as you are and, and have fun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's been a great success. We're just about to celebrate 10 years there. And then, um, but I still didn't have my great local neighborhood restaurant because uh, plays in the market and it caters to a lot of people from out of town or a lot of people who are on a night out in a town. There's not a lot of people that live in the market. And so uh, Gazelle eventually had to be born. And of course, it had to be in my neighborhood because I wanted to give back to the neighborhood that I love so much. So that's, that's Westboro. So I finally have the great neighborhood restaurant that I always wanted. Okay, so we've got your three children. Yes. Although we do have a, a young son yes. and a wife, and and this is where we take the road and the and the kind of the journey that that you have been on. Because when we have the final answer, we've got three amazing, wonderful restaurants that are you know 
en route magazine and top rated and so there's a real success story but it didn't start out that way and so you're 13 mm-hmm. um not necessarily the most comfortable of upbringings as as i'm reading from and you know when you're able to do the, the google search um where did this this industry how did you actually kind of almost like authentically as you know end up here Right. So, um, yeah, my parents split up when I was eight and uh, lived with my dad. And, and, you know, we just didn't really see eye to eye. So um, when I was old enough, uh, I wanted to get out on my own. I had always been an entrepreneur, you know, from the time I was eight years old, when my parents split up, my dad didn't want to make us lunch. So he gave us uh, two bucks a day and power of attorney to sign ourselves out of Elgin Street Public School. So I started a side hustle where I would go across to the House of Georgie's, buy French fries and resell them on the schoolyard for a nice profit, of which I would go and burn on video <laughs> games after school. Um, so, uh, you know, the That's only... awesome. Did you ever eat the French fries or were they? Oh, all... Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. You still, oh, yeah, you still ate. Sure. Okay. I had two bucks a day. It would go to yeah. my French fry craving as well. Um, but, uh, you know, after that, when we moved to Bearbrook, there was, there was no other place other than um, selling used golf balls by the side of the road that I could make money other than working for my father. So I said, okay, it's time to move in my, with my mother. And she was living in right beside Gloucester High School at the time. So um, I started in restaurants. I started busting tables when I was 13 at a place called Malibu Jacks, if you remember that. I do. Yeah, it's where the Empire Grill was for a long time, the Red Lion now, and uh, great California uh, uh, food. Anyway, it was a lot of fun, and the people there really took me in and treated me like part of their family, and uh, I didn't have a family life at home that was very comfortable. So I I wanted to work as much as possible because it was the place I felt most at home, much more so than school as well. So I tend to, I I, I went to school less and less um, and I worked more and more. So I worked full time through high school and uh, I didn't finish high school in the end. So um, I'm a high school dropout. You know, not something that it, it works for everyone, but for me with an entrepreneurial bend, it worked out just fine because you don't need an advanced degree in order to open a business. Um, But you have to find something you love. And for me, that was restaurants. You loved it, but you loved it, I'm I'm assuming not originally based on the food, but you loved it based on the sense of family, of sense of belonging. That's it. I was accepted really for the first time in my life. And, and, uh, you know, I was given this wonderful place that I could uh, overachieve. You know, because I was very young, um, expectations were maybe low. And so if I did a good job, then I would make more tips at the end of the night from the servers who I was helping. And uh, and it was great. Um, and it was a, a real family. And so I knew then and there that I wanted to open my own restaurant one day because I wanted to be able to choose my restaurant family. Um, you know, the people that I worked with would be part of my family. And I got to choose them and hire them. So it's it's great. Okay, but... You can have this love for people and this family, but there's 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 an at, the issue of food and having good food and mm-hmm. wanting to be um, a chef or to learn and to create food. So, how did that evolve? Going from yeah, you were great at busting dishes and you got along great with the staff, but that you would see what was happening in the kitchen and say, I'm you know watching that aspect of really also what makes this a restaurant successful. Right. I mean, certainly food is a, a very important part of any good restaurant, but it's not everything. So I spent a few years uh, in kitchens, but then I decided my my passions and my um, skills are actually more in the front of house. So then I started the sommelier program at Algonquin College and uh, was working as a server, um, ended up um, managing an American comedy dinner theater in Amsterdam for a couple of years. And uh, I decided actually at the time that that you know, being a chef wasn't my thing. I love cooking. I love cooking. The thing that I do most at home when I want to relax is cook, or when I want to care for people is cook at home. When I uh, feed people, it feeds me, and uh, it's an exciting thing. But um, our executive chef is Katie Artington, and she's mm-hmm. fabulous, and um, she oversees the kitchens at our three restaurants. And uh, so I spend my time on the floor um, and, you know, connecting with guests and connecting with staff as much as I can. Okay. Don't you dare try to fast forward things. Cause nope, you're like, and I went I to Amsterdam and I'm like, Oh no, no, we are yeah, not yeah, even sorry. close. <laughs> We're not even close to kind of going there. there okay. Go. So, um, so Malibu Jacks is number one yeah. as your start. I, yeah. I saw that you worked at Zen's. 
yes, at Dunn's Deli. Which just closed yesterday. Um, like, did you work at the one, though, on the corner of Rito and Dalhousie? Uh, it was George and Dalhousie. George and Dalhousie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was the one that uh, I worked at. And the guy who owned the one yeah. yesterday that closed uh, it was Stanley Devine, and he was yeah. my boss there for a while, yeah. So Stanley and my dad were actually friends. My dad, I grew up in the restaurant business. Oh, yeah? Um, I really did. I grew up in the kitchens. Like, um, So my dad at the time, well, in uh, had the Vienna Cafe, which was on George Street. It is where the Black Tomato ended oh, up taking wow. over. So, okay. um, and I grew up in the courtyard. Nice. Like so, my dad was the Vienna Cafe, and uh, I grew up overlooking the co- overlooking the courtyard. Um, and then he ended up with a couple of other ones. The Parliament Cafe, which is right across. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, it was called the Plaza. Like we had the Plaza Cafe. Yep. Um, so, uh, and you know where Darcy McGee's is now in yeah, Elgin. Of course. So that used to be called Bob's Your Uncle. Oh wow. So an so, Australian restaurant. Uh, if we, if I don't know what my dad was thinking <laughs> with with the name, but I feel like um, I've grown up in kitchens also Fun. and and unfortunately my dad my dad died very young and it was right before my wedding but I, I remember being so excited beforehand to learn to finally have an opportunity to learn from him how to cook properly oh, and he was really very much um he would never sit down to enjoy the meal until the kitchen was clean ah, so nice. the one thing I really remember about the way he cooked is that he wouldn't sit down to enjoy everything until right. he had cleaned up the mess of the meal right so it wasn't like we finished the meal and he had to go back and clean it all right it was the one thing like it was one of his quirks you know nice. yeah but I, I remember just the loving watching the process mm-hmm. uh, of what it's like to cook anyway so when I saw that it was at Dunn's I remember that we were constantly back and forth between Dunn's yep. I still love their smoked meat sandwich absolutely yeah absolutely. yeah did you get sick of those smoked meat sandwiches by the end uh, a little bit a little bit <laughs> But that's okay. Okay, so you have uh, Malibu Jacks, and then you're done. So a couple of the the, the downtown restaurants yep. you got through. Pete and Marty's, uh, yeah. O'Toole's in, uh, in Gloucester, Searville area. Yeah. And um, yeah, lots of roadhouses type places. And uh, yeah, nothing fine dining for a long, long time. No, at that point, that's what I'm saying. Like, you weren't exposed to... Um, the type of food, the type of restaurants that you would eventually create. No, nope. it just didn't exist. I think back then, anyway, like it didn't really have that. Not in the same way. I mean, you know, there was uh, Café Henri Berger in in Hull, and uh, you know, a few other really classic places in Ottawa. Um, but you know, at the time, I mean, I certainly wasn't exposed to it. I, you know, I was a connoisseur of chicken wings and potato skins yeah. at that point, not uh, you know, foie gras and fine dining. So no, you learned it though along yeah. the way. You finish. You don't finish high school. At what time? And and what was the decision to leave Ottawa and head overseas? Because this is really where the process starts of, of really developing who you would eventually become. That's it. Uh, so uh, really, so there there is a um, quote of uh, John F. Kennedy's, and he talks about um, as they're uh, going to the moon um, that. Uh, when he was a boy, um, they would uh, go around their neighborhoods and in order to be able to explore other parts outside of their neighborhood, they would t- literally take their cap and throw it over the wall um, because they had no choice but to go and follow it. So uh, I did the same thing in a little way in uh, going to Europe. Um, so I was 19, uh, a woman who I was living with broke my heart and I just needed to get out of Dodge. So sold everything that I had and bought a one-way ticket to Paris and figured out I, I would figure it out and so I ran out of money in Amsterdam uh, and I started but I wasn't ready to come home yet I was having a lot of fun and like what what were you doing there were you trying to find work in restaurants I mean no I was just backpacking yeah. around okay Europe. so I, it wasn't I, it wasn't with the intention to go and work it was the intention to go and find no the intention to not be in Ottawa <laughs> <laughs> You know, Not, and, and yeah, to mend the, men, men the broken heart. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And uh, and so I, I started uh, working for this American comedy dinner theater that uh, was a, sort of an offshoot of uh, Second City in Chicago. All the players had come from there, but uh, they loved to smoke pot. So they wanted to open up in Amsterdam so that they could smoke pot and uh, have a successful business. And, and they didn't. So this was second year in. But their food and beverage side was losing a crazy amount of money. Uh, they just didn't know what what to do. And of course, you know, I was like 19 or 20 years old at the time. And I knew all kinds of things because I'd been in the restaurant business seven years at that point as a, as a waiter or a busser or a a cook. So they invited me back to uh, run their food and beverage operations the next year. And that was, that was interesting. I certainly threw my cap over the wall. I went back home while in the off season, I learned how to speak a little Dutch. Uh, I read um, all the business books I could find. And in order to learn uh, leadership skills, I watched every Star Trek Next Generation episode so that Jean-Luc Picard taught me leadership. 
you know, that's. Uh, what, did someone suggest you do that? No, I like, always, well, like, I, I always loved the leadership lessons. So I thought, okay, this is it. And my mom's boyfriend at the time had every single episode on VHS tape. So after work, I would just stay up for two or three hours and watch episode after episode, write down the leadership lessons. And Jean-Luc Picard was my mentor. What did you learn most from those episodes or from this character? Um, to care for your team, to care for your staff, to protect them, to nurture them, to inspire them, to motivate them, you know, to challenge them. Um, that was it. And to do it with humility. You knew that you're young at this point to be able to take <laughs> this and soak in this information. But you, you knew it. Like you've had this innately in you from a very young age. Yeah. I mean, you, you, I mean, if you, if you do things you're unqualified for, you quickly figure out how to get qualified for um, them. Um, uh, a friend of mine, Toby, the CEO of Shopify, has a great quote that I love, um, which is when you realize, um, you know, at a certain point, you will never do the thing that you are really good at doing when you get to a certain level in your business. You quickly find ways to get good at the things you're not good at mm-hmm. and what you have to do. Right. I've kind of butchered the quote, but hopefully you get the meaning but behind it. You, you get the point. Yeah. And so, you know, you're you've come home, you've I mean, I would love a study session of being able to watch that much television. It's <laughs> <laughs> great, you know. And and to, but you but you took it and you ran with it and and you ran back to Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. So, were you able to incorporate the things that you know that I, you learned a lot? Absolutely. But at the you know at the time, I'm I'm still so young and still so immature. And uh, when you've got so much on the line, um, I mean, it was my most formative experience for sure. So um, the, the the owners um, tried to fill uh, the, the slots for all kinds of positions uh, any way they could. And so they, the kitchen manager was a, a cousin, no, a boyfriend of one of the owner's cousins. And the reason why he was kitchen manager is because he had worked at, as a domino pizza cook for, I don't know, a year or something. Oh, we're going to make you kitchen manager. Come on over here. Of course, I didn't get the chance to hire or interview or do anything. So you weren't building your team? Not, I didn't get a chance to yeah. really build my team. It was kind of given to me. And uh, and the difficult part is most of them came over there because, again, they wanted to smoke pot for the summertime. <laughs> and so showing up on time was not important to them. You know, working hard was not important to them. But for me, everything was about trying to make this successful. So at the end of the year, uh, they have uh, exit interviews with, with all the people and they basically, with the, the cast, the actors and uh, the senior management team, and they uh, either invite you back or don't invite you back. And of course, you know, we're going into the meeting and I'm feeling so confident. I've turned around this money losing operation to, you know, it was wildly successful, great money making operation. Everything was great in my mind. And of course, they would invite me back and give me a big raise. And they sat me down and said, well, you're not, you're not coming back. And I said, I, you know, why is that? I thought, you know, I was, you know, turned this into a huge success. And they said, well, financially, yes, but from a cultural perspective, we didn't like the way that you handled yourself. Like you would get angry and scream at, you know, the our staff. And that's not the kind of business that we want. And I said, but like, but that, that was the only way I could motivate these people who just came here to smoke drugs and, and not work. They said, it doesn't matter. Culture is more important to us than profit. And... <laughs> It was a, a huge learning lesson for me that, you know, profit is not the goal. Um, in many cases, culture is the goal, is creating this this thing, this family. So um, the yardstick changes uh, when, when profit is not the thing that you were most yeah. uh, looking for. Was Would, would that have been um, one of the life lessons that Hit you the hit you the most in this process? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, the, my trajectory changed completely based upon that. So uh, this this past summer, I'm going to jump ahead for a second. Yeah, no, 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 that's good. Yeah. Um, I got the opportunity to invite uh, my old bosses who fired me um, to Ottawa because we did this thousand person dinner on Parliament Hill. Were they there for that? And they flew in for this when they heard about it, and it was amazing to be able to uh, talk to them and share with them the the trajectory that my life changed from that meeting when I got fired. It was it was fantastic. Anyway, they've been incredibly supportive and uh, and lovely lovely and they just celebrated 25 years actually a couple months ago when Seth Meyers was one of their actors and he came back and hosted this amazing 25th anniversary party and incredible. Yeah. I think it's really special though. I mean that they would remember this employee um, from quite a number of years back, mm-hmm. you know, to be able to see this and to see your success and to be able to want to share in that. After they fired them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, you, hey, you did, you, it, 
I think it showed both the character and your ability and being able to turn around a not like a, a losing aspect of their business to be able to make the profits that it did and at the same time so find success in that and then find the next journey that you were going to be on in trying to follow this trajectory yeah I, it's amazing oh thanks i really i i didn't know that you know or where you kind of get the the backing to change your mindset yeah that, that's big you, you when get fired <laughs> you get fired but you get told or you you you're explained that profits for some people aren't the end it's, that's it's it. not the final destination it's creating this culture this family um and i think as we're going to get into where you're at now and the type of restaurants that you run that's that's a big core of it yeah it, it certainly is Okay, so we get fired in Amsterdam. Yep. Where do you go? We come back to Ottawa to lick your wounds, right? Um, you know, I was gonna stay. Did I it had hit a... the ego? Was like oh, crushing. Yeah. Um, and and you know, life tells you lessons. So um, uh, I was living with my girlfriend at the time, and uh, who was Dutch and lived in this fabulous apartment on the, the canal. And and I thought, okay, you know, I'm not gonna let this get me down. I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna apply for this food and beverage job at uh, uh, Cirque du Soleil, which was based in Amsterdam. Their European operations. I thought this is this is fabulous. And just before my interview. I was going over uh, the canal with my bike and I ended up getting hit by a car and flying over the back of this car. They weren't looking and uh, and I was really shaken up, but I wasn't injured. But I rec recognized that, you know what, I have no health insurance. This could be devastating and maybe it's time to go home. And I thought, all right, let's do that. So came home, moved in with a friend um, and then started working. Did in... you leave the girl in Amsterdam brokenhearted? No, you know, it like... She was she was okay. Like she okay. recognized that you know it was, okay. it was still pretty young and new. And although we really liked each other, there was the, our paths needed okay. to go separately at this point. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't this massive heartbreak that's going to launch you into not. another thing. Okay. No, we're, not, really, we're not. We're not there yet. We we're have not more there yet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's it. But it was it was a sign that you know it, it's it's time to go home and lick your wounds and yeah. and uh, figure out what is next. So I started. Um, I got a job serving at uh, my first. You know, tablecloth restaurant, the Ritz on Nepean Street, which yeah. which ended up being where Becta eventually was. Um, so I uh, I served there, and then I opened as a manager the um, Clarence Street location, uh, and then I ended up um, being invited to with a guy I met at a bar. Um, he said, "Oh, I'm going to the sommelier program at Algonquin." You know, I said, "Oh, that sounds like fun. Can I can I join you?" Sure, of course. And so that launched me on a completely new path. That you know, going into the the wine program at Algonquin. I realized how much I loved uh, the idea of wine, all the different facets that it encompassed, and it allowed me into this different world completely of fine dining, of sophistication uh, that you know dealt with agriculture, with trade, with uh, oniology, with you know all kinds of stuff in a, a very different world than uh, chicken wings and potato skins. And so I thought, this is really fun. This is really interesting, and this wine will be a big part of my life. <clears throat> so I was working at the Ritz. At the time, and then I started buying wine for the three Ritz restaurants. I finished the, the wine program um, quickly because back then there were only four uh, classes. Now I think there's 12. And, uh, and you know, I, I this is where I get to the, the um, met a girl uh, yeah. stage. Are we okay? okay? Have a, yeah, have a sip of your water. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll pretend it was wine. There you I, go. Although I had to learn the proper way of holding the wine and the red and the white. And that's a whole other story we'll get to. Exactly. Okay. So um, you're you're fin you're doing this sommelier program. You're doing the wine the orders for all of the Ritz. Is the Canal Ritz your your favorite? It was it was not part of the, the restaurant. Part of, it was it sold off uh, early on. Okay. Um, so the the original owner George Monsour sold them off individually. Jimmy, my boss at the time, um, bought the Elgin Street one, had the Nepean Street one, and then opened up Clarence Street. So I bought wine for those Ritz, Ritz restaurants. Mm -hmm. They're all closed down, and the Ritz uh, Canal is the only one that's still yeah. around. Um, but very different model. Um, but it was, you know, a great uh, learning process, and I got to buy wine for restaurants. But, you know, not super sophisticated. I think the most exciting wine on the list back then was a Kendall Jackson Chardonnay. Okay. Um, so, anyway, I get invited to a wedding down in Virginia. Um, the With band, this girl? No, no? I, I meet a you girl. You meet the girl there. Oh, this is getting good. So the um, the band that played after the show in Amsterdam every night um, was getting married in Virginia. And uh, two fabulous musicians, and so my my buddy Jeff and I drive down, and uh, so I meet this girl, the the the, uh, the maid of honor, and uh, we start dating. She lives in New York City, and so 
I figure when I go back, I'm getting close to opening, wanting to open my own restaurant. I'm 24 years old and I feel like uh, with a, a friend who owned an inn, we can put something together. But I, I first want to take a little time off. I want to go and see what's happening with this girl in New York. Um, I really want to go and pick some grapes during harvest in Niagara. Uh, and and then we'll come back to Ottawa and we're going to open this restaurant. Um, so I go to New York, but my friend whose wedding uh, I met her at said, you should bring a resume down just in case. You know, she really wanted me and Nina to, to be a couple. And so I thought, okay, sure, why not? Um, I meet a few people. They introduce me to a sommelier at a, a restaurant. And I just want to meet with them and talk about what it's like to be a sommelier in New York. So he says, oh, sure. It's, it's, it's like the, it's such a different environment. It's yeah. like the, it's like you're playing house league and then you're going to the Olympics. That's it. it when you think about the restaurant, the chefs and the restaurant businesses in New York City. It's sure. like the, the Mecca. That's it. Yeah. Okay. And the good news is, is that I didn't um, know that. I didn't really appreciate that because my informational interview, which turned out to be a real interview afterwards, was done in a construction site because they were building this new restaurant, Cafe Blue. And after <clears throat> meeting with Jean-Luc um, and saying, you know, asking him what it's, what's, what's your life like, basically, mm -hmm. he said, well, we actually need a sommelier for this new restaurant we're opening. Do you want to have an interview? Sure. Okay. And he asked me a bunch of wine questions and I answer them. And, and then suddenly I'm, I'm sitting in front of Daniel Ballou, this, you know, greatest chef in America at the time. And, uh, and, you know, he's asking me questions about the Ritz restaurants. He thinks, of course, it's like the, the Ritz the Carl said. <laughs> <laughs> and then that I'm buying for three sellers and oh, isn't this oh fabulous? And, yeah. I, and I've graduated from Algonquin College in the sommelier program with honors. And so this is a big uh. deal, right? <laughs> I have no clue. I've never eaten in a restaurant this good. and But again, it's a construction site, so I have right. no clue. Like, how lucky are you to be so naive at this point? I, naivety like it, naivety, is naivety was the Yeah, it was the exactly. best part of all that. That's it. So they when they call me up, I'm in the, the fields in Niagara picking grapes for harvest. Oh, okay. and they call you and you're like, oh, I'm out picking grapes. That's it. Yeah, and okay, yeah. 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 Sure, I'll, I can be there next week. So, <laughs> of course, I sell all my stuff and, and uh, you know, jump on a plane and get down there. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I spend all of my worldly money in order to buy my first suits and uh, and find an apartment in New York. And it drains everything. So, again, I've thrown my hat over the wall because there's no going back at this point. If I get fired from this job, I actually have to leave the country because the visa right, I'm on yeah. is, is job specific. So, um, so I lose everything. So I've got to make this work. So I, I go to the opening night party, which is my first day at Cafe Blue. And uh, like, and are, you, are you overwhelmed? Like, I mean, from a construction site to kind of the who's who. So I walk there. in that yeah. party and the vice president of the United States is there. The mayor <laughs> of New York, Hillary Clinton, is there. We've got uh, Robin Williams. We've got oh. Steven Spielberg. We've got all these people. And I'm like, what the hell did I get myself into? I have no clue. And then the next night, I actually have to serve wine to these people. And I'm given a bottle of this 1987 Schaefer Hillside Select, which on the list was, I don't know, seven or $800. And again, I come from the Kendall Jackson 4995 yeah. at the Ritz. <laughs> and uh, I'm told to go decant this bottle of wine at this table. I'd never decanted a bottle <laughs> of wine before. So I was like, how do I do this? Anyway, I messed it up beautifully. And when the sommelier Jean-Luc, who was training me, uh, finishes the wine and there's all this sludge in the carafe. He comes over and says, if I ever see this again, we're going to send you back to Canada. Yeah. Like it's all over. And so I quickly had to figure out how to decant a bottle of wine, the difference between this $10,000 bottle of wine and that $12,000 bottle of wine, because I'm the one having to answer those questions. So after every 13 to 15 hour day, I would go home and I would read and read and read until I fell asleep. Were you intimidated? Like, oh, I, like, hugely. okay. <laughs> like, I mean, is there nerves going up to these tables or of realizing course. the you know the clientele like that's insane it is insane especially when you had never even like it's different when you're interviewing kind of knowing what you're getting yourself into and that's kind it. of stepping up your level like you had no idea that's it and i'm 24 years old at the time and i have no clue about any of i mean this. you're just happy you have a suit at this point that you that's saved it. all your money for like hey i showed up in a suit but how, how hard can this be <laughs> exactly and it got it got very hard like you know man okay. managers were supposed to shave the expensive truffles at the 180 dollar appetizer and I, I didn't know what a truffle was. And so I'm shaving this truffle and the, 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 the customer who is sitting on the most extravagant table keeps, you know, shaving the truffle for me. And, oh, my God, most of it's gone. Like, I've just given away $1,000 of truffles to this guy. So, of course, I have to bring it back to the chef who's in the kitchen. And I drop it on the pass when he's not looking and I run away. 
the busboy comes over and says, the chef needs to see you. He's got a big banana for you. I was like, what the hell is a banana? And apparently, and he just starts screaming and throwing pots and pans and dishes and the whole How service many, like, stops. Every little shape of that truffle is, is a, so, yeah, it's, it's it's so, so expensive. expensive. And, and, you know, I don't know what a truffle is, but I know that I've just screwed up. Anyway, I probably undershaved they, truffles for the next two years just to make up for that one. Yeah. And we, we were all good. Like, how are you not fired, right? Like, were you I, just I, personable? Like, did they just, you just believe that you could figure it out? Like, and that's that, it. So Those are two major boo-boos. Actually, the, the thing oh, that really saved me yeah. was that um, this other 24-year-old person uh, at the New York Times, way in over her head, Amanda Hesser, was now writing for the food section back there, hugely powerful in the restaurant business in New York. And she decided to do an article on young sommeliers, this new generation of sommeliers that was making wine fun instead of intimidating. And so I looked to be about 12 years old. I had the baby face that yeah. is, uh, you know, was perfect for the front page of the New York Times food section about this this young breed of sommeliers who look too young to drink. Anyway. Right. And so... After that, I could do no wrong. I was on front the front page, page of the, the New, yeah, yeah, you know, the New like, York Times. It's like, yeah, do? they can't fire you. They can't fire me. So that saved my butt. Okay. So you mentioned like you had to tell the difference between a $10,000 and $12,000 bottle of wine. Yeah. Is there actually a difference? This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They're a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally, as I've been using the extension marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one-hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. To some people, there is. I mean, like, of course, there's a difference in flavor and all of this stuff. I mean, is it worth the $2,000 difference? Right, like when you're that far in, like... No, I mean, it's... it's uh, I don't know. It, to me, the value stops at a certain point, and it's well below that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I shop in the twenty to thirty dollar range, and, and you're like you at know. the vintage section at exactly. the LCBO sometimes, right? Most of the yeah. time, yeah. And you know, so look, I had some extraordinary wines with a buddy of mine this weekend, and uh, they were great. But they're far more money than I would ever pay for. Yeah. Them. But he's got lots of cash right now, so, so he wants to throw some around. Right. For... So when people are ordering that kind of stuff, like yeah. the ten, twelve thousand, it's just because they have really why not, right? There's yeah, why not? Nothing, nothing if, else. If you got the money, absolutely. But yeah. there's a there's there is a marginal quality improvement once you get past a certain point. You right. know, once you get past the fifty bucks, it's marginal. Yeah. You know, you you pay a lot more for very little extra in terms of quality. But you know what? If it brings people joy, then great. Okay, now that we're just on this topic, so let's yeah. just go right now. Like, okay, your top five picks right now. You walk into an LCBO. What are your top five picks? Well, so it, every LCBO is different. So every vintage is different. So um, when people ask me this, it's tough because I don't know what each store has. So there are some uh, vintages essentials, which most places have, which can offer some great bang for your buck. Um, you know, I think of the Catena Malbec, which is, again, I'm going to, you know, mention things in the, in the $20 range that is, are available at most LCBO or vintages outlets so that, you know, people yeah. can go. So Catena Malbec from Argentina, fabulous. Um, you know, I, I really like the Kim Crawford Sauvignon Blanc. Again, if I go to a restaurant and they don't have much selection, and if they have that, I'll order that because it, it is great. It's a well-made, well-crafted wine that um, the big conglomerate that bought it didn't mess up. You know, really good. Um, you know, Cave Spring, they've, they've got a beautiful Riesling, which again is like $18, $19 from Niagara. It's a classic and they do it so, so well year in, year out. Um, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, Perrin, who uh, is a, a family producer that uh, owns Chateau Beaucastel and Chateau Neuf de Pop. They have their, their entry level Coteron, which is like 16 bucks, totally delicious. You know, really great. Um, you know, the exchange rate has not been very favorable to Canada lately. So the American stuff that people really like uh, is is challenging because it's now costing 30% more than mm -hmm. it did a few years ago. But, um, you know, I know that that uh, some people love their, their big California cabs. And so um, a Lotus cab is something that you'll see at Vintages a lot now or on Restaurant Wine List for very good money. And uh, and it's it's a great producer. So there's there's my top five for 20 that, bucks. No, that's that's great. <laughs> I think it, it allows people and, and, and to feel good about making those purchases, right? Um, so you're bringing a bottle of wine over to someone's house. You've been invited for dinner. What's the bottle that you bring? 
So it depends on the people. It depends what they're having. It depends. So my strength in wine, I feel actually doesn't come from my tasting ability, but my empathy, me understanding people's palates and their styles. Um, that's where I feel like I really excel is that I know that, you know, my buddy Harley, who uh, I drank wine with this weekend, he would not like this great burgundy because it's not big enough. It's not juicy enough. It doesn't have enough oak. So I would never bring him, him the same bottle that I would bring uh, my friend Tim, who we stayed in their place in Burgundy. And this is the stuff he loves. So to thank them, we had them over for dinner recently. He loves, uh, he lives in France most of the time. So he loves to experience great Niagara wine. So we broke out all kinds of wonderful Niagara Rieslings, really unusual, uh, interesting stuff that, you know, my friend Harley would yeah. never love. But, but this is it, right? And I think this comes to that, that one of the first quotes that I was talking about, right? You feed people a certain way, you feed them your heart, right? Yeah. Like you, 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 and you said, like, I, I want to know their palate so that I can bring them joy in what, what they're, what they're eating. And, and I'm, like let's fast forward five minutes we're gonna get back to all of that i just want to finish your story because you're working in new york completely out of your element yeah. um and so you start to see the real kind of dining and what makes new york kind of tick yeah for sure how long did you stay there so i was in new york for four years okay um so uh, i'm back next week uh to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the opening of cafe blue so it's it was four years there then and becht has been open 15 years and there was a, a little bit of time in between um so i did two years of cafe blue and then i really went uh and found um you know my last mentors uh so richard crane uh, i'm seeing him when i'm in new york uh, we always meet and he still mentors me and it's fabulous he's the chief of staff to danny meyer and his uh, sprawling restaurant empire they own shake shack so that's a big deal it's a publicly traded company mm -hmm. now but they launched that while i was at 11 madison park 11 madison park the the restaurant i worked at second is now the number one restaurant in the world um uh, according to pellegrino uh, their their world restaurant list uh, actually, I'm sorry. They just dropped to number three this year because they were closed for six months for renovations right after they won the best restaurant in the <gasps> world. Yeah, crazy. Who does that? Who does that? Well, they, you know, they didn't know they were going to win the number one oh, restaurant, and okay. they they were ready to close down, and so they had to. They they believe in constant reinvention. Okay. That in order to be great today, you have to give up what made you great yesterday. Uh, which is a really <gasps> interesting thing. Oh, wow, it's terrifying. That, that can apply to so many things. It like, does. Wow. Okay, repeat that. Uh, constant reinvention you know in order to be great today you have to give up what made you great yesterday wow yeah i like that one it is it's inspiring and so we try to use that at our restaurants as well like we just blew up our wine bar menu at becta um uh, this past weekend completely different than it was the week before and it's really exciting it's very it's exciting for you but do you not have a client come in and they're craving their favorite meal with you yes. and they go to order their favorite wine on the list and their favorite meal and then you say sorry that's right we've changed up the menu let's find you a new favorite okay you know yeah. you you came in here you know fresh before yeah. so we're gonna make it okay. fresh for you again so yeah you gotta you gotta yeah, do that in order reinvention. to constant reinvention Okay, so you're you're doing this. You're working at this these top restaurants. I'm I'm assuming has the the love interest from the wedding dwindled at this point, or it are has. you still okay? Yeah, that right, didn't yeah. work out. It it was probably it only lasted a couple months, and then it was obvious that we were going in different directions. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, she was... Yeah, I, right, right, because you're serving wine to Hillary Clinton and Steven Spielberg at this point, right? Well, no, yeah. it, ironically, it was the opposite. <laughs> she was very interested in, in creating um, a very, I don't know if flashy is the right word, but very elaborate lifestyle mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, houses in the Hamptons oh, and gosh. long weekends and yeah. all this stuff. And that just didn't interest me. I mean, I, I'm a high school dropout from a very basic background, and uh, so I wasn't really interested in that in that yeah. lifestyle. Um so that's okay, you know. So we we left our ways, and we're still on good speaking terms. And and but no, I uh, I came back for a friend's wedding in Ottawa, and of course met a girl at a wedding, um, which is great. You at, like statistically meet all the things of best places to meet your love interest for sure. at a wedding. At last yeah. call at the bar yeah. while she had another date uh, at this wedding, and uh, I was in town for only thirty six more hours, and we hung out together for the rest of the time, uh, and then I got on a plane. To France, um, I was working at the top restaurants in Paris for two weeks on an exchange program with Alain Ducasse and his restaurant group. And uh, we talked on the phone every night for eight hours, and our phone bill was just devastating. Um, but because of the time difference, we could, you know, I would get home from work at 11 o'clock at night, and she was just getting home from work at 5 o'clock 
six o'clock in the afternoon. And so we could literally talk throughout the night. And it was crazy. Um, so anyway, she came to New York to visit me. I came back to Ottawa. And very quickly, we knew one of us was moving. And she came to New York for a while and tried that for five weeks. And, and when I came back to Ottawa, all the pieces sort of aligned. She never lets me forget that, you know, it's, it's going to be her turn at some point because I wanted to move back to Ottawa. She wanted to move to New York. Um, which wow, is, really? I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought the only thing that was missing in Ottawa was a great job to go to that I could then create with a, a restaurant and a great woman to be with. So I, I wanted to come back and she thought, wow, this is my ticket out of Ottawa. New York's so exciting. <laughs> But it just didn't work out that way. You know, the world told us that Ottawa was the place and, and it, you know, it's worked out really and well. It, and it really has been. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you, um, so I'm going to go, because you come back. Yes. And and there's this, because you've built these restaurants. And when I actually say, like, you've built them, like, you actually, like, did the the handyman work. That's it. There, for some of it. There was no money to have a general contractor, so... Again, we had to figure it out. You throw the, the cap over the wall and you figure it out. So uh, so I've, I've gotten actually pretty good at being a general contractor. So uh, at first it was because there was no money and then opening up Play and then Gazellig and then the moving and redoing of, of Becta and then our house has just got to be fun. Uh, it's, again, another challenge, another, you know, arrow in your quiver. So, um, you know, I end up doing a lot of the fixing around the restaurant when things break because um, it's fun. I love that, you know, front and center and then going into the back to fix the plumbing, you know, like that, that's real. Yeah. New Year's Eve, you weren't two doing... years ago at Becta when our hot water was down on our busiest night of the year, I'm there in my suit, my wedding suit, you know, fixing the plumbing, uh, you know, for three hours. And that was, uh, that was crazy. We're boiling water and doing dishes and it was intense, but that's, that's the restaurant business. You got to figure it out. Okay. So I, I'm going to come to You've been able to come back. You create Becta. You uh, have this restaurant that takes on its uh, another life of itself. I think probably with people understanding the background and the type of restaurants that you had been exposed to and learned from. But this is where you start. You're building your family. Mm-hmm. And, and this is where I want to come to because this is where we get to kind of food and the, the changes that you've seen in people's mindsets and the changes of how people view food I want to be able to get to. You create this family atmosphere. What does that entail when you talk about that in your restaurants? Uh, I mean, the thing that we all want is to be accepted, right? And so we want to have such a warm, welcoming hospitality that it feels like an emotional hug when you walk through the door, uh, where we use food and wine as tools in order to care for you, in order to make you happy, in order to make you more whole. Um, you know, food and wine are nourishment, they're sustenance, they, they restore you and replenish you. And that's what we want to do is use those items to be able to care for people deeply uh, at our restaurants. But you do that with your staff. I mean, there's communal, like you feed your staff. That's it. So there's family meals every day. This is something that I didn't invent, but stole from, you know, many restaurants in New York. But if, if did our... you like seeing that in New York? Like, oh, did I you like, for okay. Sure. But, but if, if our staff don't feel cared for, they can never truly care for other people. You know, if people are not, if they feel like they're, they're not being treated fairly um, or just, you know, or if your boss doesn't like you, then why are you going to work hard in order to care for the people in front of you? It's it's very basic. Do they get to have the food? Like when you're making these communal meals, like what 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 happens? Like are, are you? <laughs> it, I mean, it depends yeah. on the day. I mean, yeah. you know, some day it's it's pizza. Like the the cooks all take different uh, shifts uh, preparing meals, so they'll take turns. Uh, and is it for instance, if it's someone's last day with us, uh, they'll get to pick the family meal. So. Maybe it's fried chicken, or maybe it's pizza. Maybe it's uh, so. It's not. It's not items off of. No, it's, it's not, not the menu. It, it's it's really a family meal. It's, that's it. It's whoever. This kind of leads me into where the profits are more. It's not about the profits. It's more about the culture. Because I would think feeding your staff every day there's 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 a cost to that. There's so, a huge cost yeah. to that, and but at the same time, it's the thing that benefits us most. I feel um, it's it's a, actually less about the food cost, you know, which we budget about depending on the restaurant and the, the number of uh, staff we have, uh, it's about fifteen or $25,000 a year per restaurant. Um, but it's actually the, the labor cost to pay them while they're eating um, and talking about what's happening that night, who's coming in, what's happening. It's having them come in earlier than, for instance, the tables that they're going to serve. Sometimes they don't serve tables for two hours after we've fed them. But that's just the reality. We want them to be there to experience that um family meal that, uh, 
you know, important part of our day and find out what's happening and, um, you know, what's important that night. You have your set menus in all of, and you have these restaurants. What have you found has been in looking at the food industry in general? Mm -hmm. Is it segmented? Is it, you know, what are people looking for when they're heading out to a meal? It's constantly in flux. Like, you know, um, what, what was popular last year or last week is not popular today and new things are popular again. Um, you know, there's certainly been a trend towards more casual restaurants. Mm-hmm. Um, when we moved back to, to Elgin Street, we bucked that trend uh, in terms of our fine dining area. Um, you know, most restaurants are getting out of this business of fine dining and we really embraced it because we still feel like there's a very important part of life and dining uh, that is about reverential meals, about uh, fine dining, about tablecloths, about private dining, about, you know, something, you know, dressing up fancy for a night and doing it all right. You know, um, we had a couple that came in last week uh, after this woman had a horrific um, boating accident that was in a induced coma for a couple of weeks. And, you know, uh, a friend of mine had sent them a limo and picked them up and brought them in and said, I want to take care of dinner. And this, and this is amazing. And then he flips me an email on the weekend. They got engaged that night and sends me the picture of everything. And it's, you know, you can't do that at a, at a, you know, local hipster spot that just doesn't work the same way. It's not, it doesn't give the same significance to it. You have to have places that are very special for, uh, occasions like this. Okay. But let's say you have the same meal. Let's say you have the same meal being served in two different places, Mm -hmm. one in a casual setting and one in a fine dining setting. So the plates look totally the same. Is it just how it's presented, how it's like that it makes it so vastly different, the experience? Yeah, absolutely. When it's not necessarily (laughs) the food itself. It can be the same meal served at one place and another. The The food is one component. Like it really is one component and in many cases it's a small component and you know our chefs will actually say the same thing because we hire them not only for their culinary skills but also their uh, emotional skills to care for one another and to care for our guests through their food. So recognizing that if people don't feel cared for through their greeting, through their phone call to make the reservation, through the front door, through going to the bathroom, then they're never going to be able to enjoy that meal even if the quality of the food is the same at both places. So they recognize as well that it is a whole package and mm-hmm. that they are taking care of a portion of it, um, but a very important portion of it. Can you tell people's perspective of food has changed? I mean, the food industry, uh, the food intolerances. I mean, you're you're given a lot more. Um, I would think it's a lot harder to cook right now it is. for people uh, based on just people's perception or how they react to foods. Like, yep. a lot of, we, we are had, there any dietary restrictions at this table, right? Like, you weren't dealing with that 20 years ago. You certainly would not. Um, so we just did um, our biggest event ever, a, a catering event for 1,200 people at uh, Lansdowne Park a couple weeks ago and of the 1200 people we had almost 200 dietary restrictions or allergies that we needed to deal with we had spreadsheets on spreadsheets on spreadsheets on how we were going to cook for these people and how we were going to serve for these people and the the crazy part is that we didn't know where they were sitting in advance so they would only tell us when they sat down we had headsets and microphones and walkie talkies and all kinds of crazy stuff just to try to figure out how to do that so the logistics has gotten much more challenging than it used to be for yeah. sure but so of our tools so is technology you know when uh, a guest makes a reservation online we have notes in their system in, the, in their uh, profile that already tells us that this is the way they like their coffee this is the thing that they uh, won't have you know we have a great regular customer who has a severe intolerance uh, or allergy to shellfish but never tells the servers and will never tell a reservationist or a manager you, they just expect that you know because they made a reservation under their name so you figure it out you know, it's it's part of the way that you have to care for people is is figuring out their quirks and their allergies. Do you find that uh, people have their quirks uh, because food is, is so much a reflection of health and fitness and how they see food and, you know, if they're indulging that night in having dessert or, you know, that um, some people battle their relationship 
with oh, food. Absolutely. Right? Like you're you're hoping people embrace and feel loved and feel cared for, and yet there's a lot of people who food is their enemy, right? It's it's a constant battle in their head. That's it. So you have to provide that love and caring in other ways then. So if they are just having a salad while everyone else is having, you know, three or four or five courses, how do you make them feel cared for in that environment? How do you make it fine and okay? Um, it's how you deal with them, right? It's it's how you converse with them. It's how you um, assuage them, you know? Um, you know, let's turn that salad into a three or four course salad so that you can eat with those other people because you're going to be most embarrassed by that part. The fact that you have nothing in front of you while these other people are mm-hmm. having three or four or five courses. So um, you let empathy drive everything. When you're at home, you're, uh, you know, like, hey, I'm going to whip up a quick dinner. Yeah. What's, what's whipping up a quick dinner for you? To me, it's around getting the best products and not messing them up. So going to farmer's markets or going to uh, grocery stores that really believe in great products. Um, Farm Boys are on the corner for us, and I really like what they do. Um, I got this incredible steak the other day from Seed to Sausage, 80-day dry-aged dry ribeye. And you know what? It's really not that much more expensive than Loblaws, like 10 or 20% more. But it is like 4,000 times better in terms of its quality. Salt and pepper, cast iron pan, you're done. Like okay, cook. so okay, five. Okay, we, we got your top five list of wines around that twenty dollar mark. Five things that you think everyone should have in their kitchen. Uh, that steak. <laughs> <laughs> Go to see the sausage on Gladstone. Get okay, one of these. Okay. They're awesome. Yeah. Uh, you want to have a good knife, and you want it to be sharp. Um, if it's sharp, it's safe. Um, it's not going to skip on you, and you're going to be able to to cut. Uh, products well and and cutting things well it's meditative it is such a beautiful um, experience uh, to be able to prep ingredients uh, with a nice knife Um, and just keep it sharp learn how to learn how to sharpen it so uh, definitely have that around so a steak and a knife a steak and a knife for sure yeah Um, uh, miso is an ingredient that I have picked up recently that enhances everything so umami is a huge flavor in mine. It's it's the fifth um, uh, sense, uh, or fifth taste bud, excuse me, that um, that uh, Asians, specifically the Japanese, really key on, but that we in North America, you know, tend to dismiss or not have around very much. But um, it's found in bacon. It's found in steaks. It's found in tomatoes. It's found in uh, MSG is actually a derivative. It, it is trying to mimic the taste of umami. Uh, but miso, uh, beautiful, fresh, uh, fermented miso, is like the, the greatest thing. It's the greatest umami enhancer. So any soup, sauce, uh, anything, you just put a dab of miso in and wow, the flavor just explodes. So um, I would definitely do that. Okay. Um, great stock. So I've been on this Brodo kick lately. Brodo is bone broth. So um, it's it's basically like super juiced up chicken soup, if you will. You can make it. Beef bones to me is is the best because the the life enhancing properties of the marrow uh, in beef bones. Um, if you make a stock with this, uh, and it's it's for drinking. It's not. I mean, mm-hmm. you can use it as a base for everything, but. Uh, Marco Conora has a, a, res, a great restaurant in New York called Hearth, but he also has this chain of stores called Brodo, where you literally, instead of going to get a coffee, you get a cup of broth. And it is fabulous. So I've been on a huge kick to this, and I give it to friends when they're sick, and I make up huge batches at home. So everyone should have some of this in your freezer. So you can order it online from brodo.com, I think it is, the, through the States. But um, just get the recipe because he puts it right out there and you can make he it, does at it. Home. but like to think that you can have i mean and this is one you go only in new york right that you yeah. can have you know, a business based on broth. This broth yeah but it's brilliant it is brilliant and do you see the health benefits like are there foods that you that you acknowledge and, and see and want to have in your life because you realize the the health benefits of consuming so, them brodo is a huge yeah. one so my best friend's dad was in the hospital um with uh Whipple procedure. So basically, they redid all of his internal organs after uh, cancer was removed, and uh, he couldn't keep any food down for months. And uh, brought him some Brodo. Basically, after all chemotherapy and all this stuff, you they they burn out all of the the, the good bacteria in your mm-hmm. gut. And um, I believe Brodo helped restart the gut bacteria. Uh, it's like the prebiotics that lead to the probiotics that just lead mm. to to good digestive ability and anyway he went home three or four months early after the week after 
drinking this Brodo. And I really believe that that was the key. So, so yeah, good bone broth is, uh, is the thing that, that will, will help a lot of people in a lot of, um, pain or suffering, but it also makes you feel good when you drink it. So, um, that's half the battle right there. So you're sick. That's where you're going. Yes. And is it hard to make? No, I mean it's lengthy. Like you've got to bubble it away on the stove for a day and a half, but um, <laughs> it's not hard to make. Like you're just cutting up carrots so, and celery and onions and and throwing them in with with um, um, like real uh, collagen rich uh, beef or chicken and duck or pork bones, fish. Like there's all kinds of things. Brodo the mm-hmm. book, you just go and get it at Chapters and it's fabulous. It's twenty bucks and it has all the recipes in there. Okay, yeah. I've I've never cooked out. I'm never cooked from a recipe. Yeah, I don't usually, Yeah. but with this one, I mean, I riff on it already. Like yeah. I'm putting ginger and turmeric yeah. in there because of its anti-inflammatory properties. Um, but I use it as a base and then you can riff on it for sure. Because um, we all just can riff on our food. Yeah. I, I love how you talk, you know, I be, there's a passion, like you see it. Like for me, I chop up a salad and I throw in some chicken and I'm like, there, ta-da! There's a riff. No, <laughs> there's but, dinner. <laughs> exactly. But you know, like it'll do it, you'll do it differently tomorrow. You, you've learned yeah, that, yeah. you know what? It's missing a little acidity. I'm going to throw in some more tomatoes or it's missing a little heat. Maybe I'll throw some pepper in there, you know? Like, you figure it out. Okay. Your son's favorite meal. If he says, dad, can you make me, what is it? Foie gras. <laughs> come on <laughs> it is oh, come so, on no like mac and cheese or no, a peanut butter he, and jam sandwich foie no. gras he, uh. he he uh early on recognized that he could get uh a lot of attention from adults by eating things that he, that they didn't think kids should eat right so at one and a half at a staff party we had he ended up eating like this whole lobe of foie gras <laughs> and the the people went bananas for it so he had uh, uh, an emotional memory from that, that if he eats foie gras, then adults pay attention. And so he thinks that that's the tastiest thing in the world because emotionally it gives him the greatest feeling. So when we were in France in, in July, he ordered beef tartare and foie gras at every place that had it. And every single waiter said, you know, that's raw, right? And he's like, yep, that's why he wants it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you see that emotional connection. For sure. So you know it's there. Yeah, Absolutely. It's not about the taste of that food. It's it's that this taste corresponds to this emotion. What do you have? Like what food is there that you have that you know creates an emotional reaction to something? For me? Yeah. Uh, shepherd's pie. My mom's shepherd's pie. Pâté chinois. Uh, she was French Canadian. And, you know, that was the thing that she would feed me when I needed uh, emotional sustenance. Um, she would, you know, she knew I have a big week. She would do a big pan of it and leave it in the fridge so that I could just eat it throughout the week. And so that's my connection. Do you make it? Every once in a while. My son doesn't love it because he doesn't feel that emotional connection. And for him, it's, you know, ground beef and mashed potatoes. And it's like, "Eh." you know, all kids like that kind of stuff. So it's not of interest to him because he doesn't get a rise out of adults. But for you, it's an emotional, it's the emotional connection. For sure. That, that is, that is, uh, you know, uh, that's caring for me in a, in a dish. And for your wife, if you're kind of like, I need to, I need to step up my game tonight. What are you making her? That's it. Um, you know, for her, everything is about super healthy. Like she really wants to eat well. So uh, a great salad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if she's indulging, you know, last night we broke out some really great cheeses that we had left over from the weekend. I went away with uh, my buddy and, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, bringing her back to a great place in France where she did some schooling and, and fell in love with the cheeses. So, um yeah, you know, something super healthy or something super decadent like yeah, is cheeses. she like me because she's super healthy, she can enjoy the salad. And then she loves indulges in the cheeses and then for the next 24 hours is like, my stomach is killing me. Yeah, I mean, it's not her stomach. For her, it's like, okay, oh. you know, I ate too much bread, so therefore I need to be good for the next oh, okay. week and not eat some carbs and this kind of thing. I feel it. Like, you? you know, when I think when you have a clean system and you and you indulge, your system kind of goes, what, what did you just do? We loved it. It was fantastic. It. Um, okay, so presentation. I, for me, I love a good charcuterie board. Yeah. Like, if you're entertaining or people are entertaining, what would you suggest that they have in their home when their guests arrive? So yeah, charcuterie is a great way to start. I, I love it. I mean, I, I eat charcuterie every day. That is that is my go-to. When I get home from, from work, I put together some kind of dried saucisson and some fruit and a glass of wine, and that's that's what I'm doing. Um, so when people come over, it's so easy. Um, uh, again, seed to sausage, I'm going to go back to. This store is awesome. They have the best saucisson in the world, in my mind. 
Uh, and then they also have great training. And if you say in the taste. world, you've actually been around the world and eaten around the world. Yeah, so that's a I pretty just, good thing to say. I, I love this. I mean, Mike McKenzie's a genius and, and they have just wonderful products at very fair prices and, uh, and their shop on Gladstone just yeah. kills it. Um, so yeah, great charcuterie board that people can nibble on while you're connecting because you want to have something ready for people and you don't want to be, you want to focus on them while they arrive and while you're settling in. Um, so that's great. To me, mm-hmm. I like che- leaving cheeses to the end because they especially the triple creams they're very rich and they can they can crush a meal because you you just destroyed your palate with all this super rich food right at the beginning um so you so save cheeses till the end for the end i mean it's to me it's cheese would be instead of dessert you know that's that's my preference yeah um it becomes a dessert course as it is in france so that's that's what i like and favorite place around the world to eat Whew. It's hard. I mean, we're going to New York and next week, and it's it's hard not to love New York because of the variety of everything. It's the it's so much the best of everything. You can have the best ramen in the world. You can have the best sushi in the world. You can have the best local seasonal stuff in the world. Um, the best meal I've ever had was with my wife at the Blue Hill Stone Barns in upstate New York. It's about an hour north of New York City where they have their own 100-acre organic farm where they raise all their own animals. They grow all their own products. They have a you know two-acre greenhouse through the winter where they're, they're picking baby vegetables seconds before they hit your plate like it's ridiculous and Dan Barber is the most inspired chef and he the way he thinks about food uh, the way he thinks about the raw ingredient that goes onto the plate is is extraordinary because he of how he works with the farmers to cultivate those ingredients and to bring them back like these heirloom ingredients that are are amazing so yeah Blue Hill Stone Barns would be my favorite place but you know Paris France everything from a simple perspective you know France Italy they just have the most amazing products so available to you because of their agricultural policies we just don't have that you know where there's a market going on every day in a different neighborhood right around you that has the most amazing products Mm -hmm. at subsidized rates we don't have that in canada and we should have that at some point but uh i don't know Uh, europe because of its concentration has that has that i mean and you've you've fought pretty hard on being able to bring things uh to the city uh you I, I, we didn't really get into this, but I mean, you've you've initiated so many different programs. Congratulations on the thousand, the 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 table, yeah, chef's thanks. table. I mean, to, to be able to see the pictures of seeing the thousand people eating, uh, it was truly remarkable. But there's there's the giving back side too as well. Mm. I mean, I know they sit on boards. It's the boys and girls. Um, the boys and girls. Boys club. and girls so, club. Like, yeah, I'm I'm the chair there now for yeah. the last year, and I've been on the board for seven years. I went to the club as a kid, and it's very very important to me. And it's very important to the kids that, that we serve. 4,500 members, uh, 110,000 visits last year. Um, you know, 53,000 of those were to Homework Club. Um, so it is, as our executive director, Colleen Mooney, uh, talks about, um, it, you know, education is the tool to get these kids out of the cycle of poverty. Um, ironically, I'm a high school dropout, so I'm not much of a role model in that way. Um, but for her, many of these kids would be high school dropouts and wouldn't have the opportunities to go on to post-secondary education. And so Homer Club allows these kids uh, that help to be able to uh, complete high school, mm-hmm. to be able to go to post-secondary. Um, but we also bribe them with a healthy snack. Um, so you go to Homer Club, how, yeah, you get like, free food. Yeah, but that's a component right there, it's right? It's a huge it, thing. A, you, have to the feed, yeah. you have to feed their bodies in order to feed their brains. You know, if they're hungry, they can't learn. And they certainly can't. They don't want to stay and, and you know, play basketball or, or do some art projects or you know, go for a swim or do indoor soccer or whatever the other great programs that we offer, um, they need some food because oftentimes they're just hungry, you know. So that's that's part of what we do is provide those healthy snacks to kids. There's no there's no charge for anyone, you know. It's uh, um, your behavior is your entrance fee. Uh, how you treat uh, each other and yourself, the respect that you show, that is the agreement that, that kids make when they become members. It's important to you. Yeah, it's huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would you want to be able to feed them if you could sit down with one of these kids, you know? Well, we do. We, we I mean, I know sh- that they have snacks, right? Like, but do they know? I mean, they know that there are important people who sit on boards who help make these things possible, right? We, in the community, those who can, like we sit on boards, we're, we try to, to give back to the community as much as possible. But there would be some kind of this relationship with the child sitting there of your food and your thought and your as I as I'm learning through all this it's about family and and empathy and belonging so do you ever see that and say if I could just 
give absolutely but we do like we i mean but they feed themselves in a way so um i i won a, a, an award a few years ago and used the money uh, to supercharge the garden at one of the clubhouses and so the kids grow all their own food through the summertime uh, for the healthy snacks program and because they're out there weeding every single day and cultivating every single day like the, the amount of food that gets produced is extraordinary so they're making their own stuff uh, to feed themselves and it's fabulous. We recently had the the graduates from the Leaders for Life program uh, after four years of this program through high school um, you know instead of doing a fancy party they wanted to go out for a special meal at lunch so they came for a lunch at Gazellic and it was incredible you know these kids had never had some of this food before and it was so fun to see them um, you know getting dressed up and taking it seriously and and, and it being part of that ritual um, so we do get the opportunity yeah to like feel. I mean that would be special is to see these kids who don't this wouldn't be a normal everyday activity right to be able Correct. to go out and sit in a restaurant and be served mm -hmm. uh, and have this and so you see the change in them in these experiences you do you really do um, you know they are they're bigger because of it they have thrown their cap over the wall um, they are trying something new and they are giving themselves value and they you know they're they're doing something that is scary you know for many of these kids going into a fancy restaurant is a scary thing ordering something that they've never heard of is a scary thing um, but they come back changed they come back bigger because of it you have talked a lot about throwing a cap over the wall yeah do you have another cap to throw over a wall? Like oh, yeah. where, where, oh, yeah. where do you see this going? Where, what's next? Uh, there's a project I'm working on right now that I can't talk about because it's part of an institution that's, uh, anyway, it's, uh, there's something very exciting coming down the pipeline. If, uh, we get approval from it, uh, tomorrow and then in the coming couple months, uh, maybe next time we can talk about it. Um, but it's very exciting and it's outside of our three restaurants, but it's, it's a way to extend our culture of caring beyond our four walls, um, into the community. And, uh, anyway, it's, it's really exciting. I'll let you know when, when we get the approval and we can talk more about it, but it, I think it will have a huge impact on the Ottawa community. Uh, and for a lot of people who really, uh, will benefit from it. Uh, so we'll keep that on the radar. Yeah. Um, and for now it's just, there's it's busy it's busy it's busy time yeah. and there's lots of customers who uh, are in the restaurants we again we have this great new menu in our casual wine bar at the back of Becta that we've just launched and that's really exciting and um, you know it's I don't know it's a it's a fun time there's lots of uh, family members within our three restaurants uh, that need caring and need love and then our guests that show up every night um, I don't know it's a fun exciting time it's really nice to see. Is it a long wait to get into Becto these days? No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> on a Saturday night at 730, yeah, yes. you got to call a couple of weeks ahead of time. But on a Monday night at 6 o'clock, just show up and we'll, <laughs> we'll get you a seat for sure. You know, not everyone needs to dine out at 730 on a Saturday night. Like, pick your battles. <laughs> <laughs> Mondays can be special too. They can just be. Book so they Tuesday on, be. Just exactly. book Tuesday off work. Exactly. I mean, there, there's ways to really go about it. Uh, you've got uh, Becta, um, one, uh, uh, what? I messed that up. Uh, back to dine and wine. Yep. Just, okay, so that's on Elgin. Yep. Uh, you've got Gazellic right on in Westboro. Is yep. it on? Is it on the Richmond or the Wellington side? Uh, corner of Richmond and Churchill. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's really it's really quite pretty. You've got like this perfect corner lot right there. Yeah. Uh, and then of course you have Play, which is downtown in the Byward Market. You got. It. It was a pleasure. Thank you. There was just so much. And I'm like, oh, my God, there's going to be so much that I forgot about. But I don't even know. It. I, I dropped my phone. What am I timing? Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. We gotta, yeah. we gotta cut some stuff. <laughs> no, we're not cutting anything. Okay. We're not cutting anything. I really appreciate the time. Uh, this is um, and I'll have a different perspective next time I'm, I'm eating a meal or, or kind of understanding the people are in, that are in the environment, especially at, at your locations. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a wrap, I believe, on 35, episode 35, please. We've had um, the great milestones uh, with this podcast and seeing it cross borders, and I'm really enjoying seeing some of the feedback. So if you can like or subscribe or let us know what you think, maybe some suggestions for some future guests, uh, that would be fantastic but it helps to continue make this uh, podcast grow as it continues to do each and every day thanks so much and have a fantastic day